Major road construction often requires the formation of deep cuttings and high embankments. As a result, the cost of construction of the earthworks on a motorway project can total a third of the cost of the scheme. Much of this expenditure arises from the need to transport considerable quantities of material from the cuttings to form the embankments. On rural motorways, the quantity of material to be excavated averages about 90,000 cubic meters per kilometer of road, with very variable haul distances. In modern road construction, the transportation of the material for the earthworks is normally carried out by dump trucks, lorries, or scrapers. There's been a continuing process of development with this type of plant. Much of the resulting increased productivity has been achieved by the use of very large machines capable of traveling at relatively high speeds. These machines have very high wheel loads, which accentuate the problem of earthwork construction under our climatic conditions, especially with cohesive or silty soils. Work is often seriously interrupted or even entirely suspended in periods of prolonged wet weather and during the winter. Belt conveyors appear to provide a promising system largely independent of the bearing capacity of the soil for the transportation of the fill material. Together with the use of vertical face excavation, increased utilization of plant appeared possible, and the Transport and Road Research Laboratory initiated a detailed study into the feasibility of using such a system for earthwork construction in roads. Costs were estimated for the operation of a belt conveyor system assuming that high utilization would be achieved throughout the year. The costs of using scrapers and dump trucks were also estimated. Belt conveyors were shown to be more economical than conventional plant, where significant quantities of fill material had to be transported over distances exceeding about one kilometer. The results of the feasibility study were sufficiently promising to justify a full-scale trial to establish the cost of belt conveyor operations in practice. The site selected for the trial was the Portsmouth Harbour area of the M27 South Coast Motorway. A complex interchange was required in the upper reaches of Portsmouth Harbour, and the embankments were to be constructed in an advance contract. The total volume of fill material required in the embankments was about four million cubic meters. Fill in the eastern half of the interchange comprised hydraulically placed sand, while fill in the western half was provided from chalk cuttings in Portsdown Hill on the line of the motorway. The mean haul distance for the chalk of about four kilometers was one at which belt conveyors were likely to be the most economical method of earth moving, as shown in the feasibility study. Besides promising economic benefits, the conveyor was attractive on this site because the chalk had to be transported through a densely populated housing estate, and the noise and dust normally associated with the operation of scrapers and dump trucks would have caused considerable disturbance to the residents of the estate. There was also a need to cross a railway line, the A27 trunk road, and a busy estate road, and a lightweight structure carrying a belt conveyor appeared to offer the simplest method of crossing these obstructions without interfering with the traffic using the railways or roads. A target price contract was used to make the cost of the operations available to the laboratory and allow the selected contractor, John Lang Construction Limited, to be involved in the early stages of the detailed planning of the contract. Overall responsibility for the contract lay with the Southeastern Road Construction Unit. Belt conveyor equipment for the transportation of the chalk was specified and purchased by the Department of the Environment from Messrs. Doughty Miko Limited. Manufacture of the conveyor equipment and delivery to the site was completed within seven months. Initially, the equipment was placed in store in a government building near the site. Each section of belt conveyor had a drive head supplying the motive power to the belt, powered by one, two or three 37 kilowatt electric motors, depending on the length and incline of the conveyor section. A loop take-up contained the belt tensioning mechanism, and intermediate structure of appropriate length supported the belt-carrying idlers and return rollers. A tail unit was combined with a loading hopper to receive the material discharged from the preceding drive head. The belt, about one meter wide, traveled at a speed of 2.4 meters per second. 
A pull wire system for stopping in an emergency was provided along each side of the conveyor. Operation of each section was dependent upon the operation of the succeeding section by automatic sequence control. The specified capacity of the conveyor was 1,200 tons per hour. A terminal discharge conveyor was provided to form a stockpile in the fill area. The total length of conveyor was 5.1 kilometers, consisting of 16 sections. 350 meters of continuous overhead structure was included to cross the roads and the railway. The construction of this was the first operation on site. It spanned in turn the estate road, the railway line and the A27 trunk road. The spans over the roads and the railway were enclosed in corrugated sheeting to avoid the danger of material dropping from the conveyor onto traffic or pedestrians. Sufficient belt conveyor was then erected to link the nearest points of the cut and fill areas. This comprised five sections with a total length of about 1.6 kilometers inclusive of the overhead structure. During erection of each section of conveyor, the drive head and associated loop take-up were positioned and the intermediate structure was laid out. Then the idlers and return rollers were installed in the structure and the tail unit located and anchored. Finally, the belt was threaded, the individual lengths of belt being connected by mechanical joints. Power for the conveyor, except for the areas immediately adjacent to the excavation and discharge points, was always provided by mains electricity. The method of excavation of the chalk was left to the choice of the contractor. Bulldozers fed a belt loader which produced a regulated flow of chalk to the belt conveyor through a vibrating screen to remove the oversized lumps. In the harbour area, chalk fill initially had to be placed in water and an end tipping procedure had to be adopted. The chalk, unloaded from a discharge conveyor into a stockpile, was pushed ahead and spread by bulldozers. During excavation, the chalk suffered a large degree of pulverisation producing a high proportion of fine material and a consequent release of water normally held within the pores of the chalk lumps. This resulted in very soft conditions in the freshly placed chalk, giving rise to difficulties in operating the plant. The chalk became firm, however, within a few weeks of placement, and after placing all the lower layers of chalk to above water level, a change of method was adopted. A travelling radial stacker was introduced, capable of unloading a section of conveyor at any point along its length. The machine was rail-mounted with a radius of discharge of a little over 20 metres. It reduced the effort required from the bulldozers and the frequency of extensions of conveyor. As excavation in Portsdown Hill progressed, extensions of conveyor were required. This entailed initially moving the belt loader forward a distance of about 60 metres to a new position. The vibrating screen and the tail unit of the trunk conveyor were then moved forward and located accurately with respect to the belt loader and the projected line of the conveyor. Intermediate structure was inserted to link the tail unit in its new location to the existing conveyor structure, an appropriate length of belting added, and the belt retensioned. After adding the pull wire emergency stop system and connecting the portable generators, the conveyor was restarted. Following adjustments to correct any mistracking of the conveyor belt, earth moving operations proceeded. In the fill area, when using the original discharge conveyor, a fairly similar operation occurred when an extension was required. The discharge conveyor was advanced, and the drive head and associated loop take up were moved forward to line up with it. Sufficient intermediate structure was erected to fill the gap. Conveyor belting added, and the mechanical joints made. Finally, the belt was retensioned and tracked prior to restarting earth moving operations. In some instances, retraction of the conveyor was required, and the reverse process then took place. After the introduction of the travelling radial stacker, the discharge conveyor was used occasionally as a second discharge point to minimize the effect of extensions or retractions of conveyor. Tunnels were driven in the chalk at two locations where the excavation of the cuttings had to be interrupted at minor road crossings and the conveyor extended through them. The most prominent causes of breakdown were blockages of the system by the wet chalk, 
failures of belt joints, and failures in the electrical control circuits. With a continuous system such as a belt conveyor, any breakdown gives rise to a total stoppage, and inspection at regular and frequent intervals and a program of preventive maintenance are advisable to minimize the loss in production. The contractor employed a team of fitters and electricians to carry out the maintenance and repair of the belt conveyor. To assist in monitoring the work, the laboratory installed a belt wear and chart recorder which registered the cumulative quantity of chalk conveyed, the instantaneous rate of flow along the belt, and the productive hours of the system. The rate of loading material onto the conveyor was variable, and the average rate of flow achieved was about 850 tons per hour, 70% of the designed peak capacity of the conveyor. The utilization of the belt conveyor system averaged about 55% of the total available working hours throughout the trial. Losses of production were caused by the necessity to extend the conveyor, problems such as breakdowns and blockages along the trunk conveyor, and stoppages at the loading plant and at the unloading plant. The remainder of the losses resulted from bad weather and unclassified problems. The utilization increased to 63% when the period required for familiarization with the new method of earth moving was eliminated by taking the most successful 12 months. The losses in utilization associated with extensions of conveyor could be eliminated in future by locating the trunk conveyor outside the cut and fill areas and using semi-mobile belt conveyor equipment for the loading and unloading operations. Excavation could be by bucket wheel excavators and in the fill area, a special spreading conveyor could be used. Such methods were envisaged in the original feasibility study, which led to the full-scale trial. Many of the breakdowns and stoppages of the system as a whole would probably be avoided in future road schemes as a result of the experience gained in the trial. The pulverized, wet state of the freshly excavated chalk gave rise to problems with the mobility of the plant and caused losses in production. During extensions of the conveyor, especially in the early stages of the contract, equipment often had to be moved over soft chalk, adding to the wear and tear and causing delays. If allowance is made for the elimination of some causes of lost production, it might be expected that, on the majority of future schemes, utilizations that approach the average of 80 to 85 percent assumed originally can be achieved. The cost of operations in the trial totaled 68 pence per cubic meter, comprising installation and dismantling, excavation and loading, the operation, maintenance and extensions of the belt conveyor, the unloading of the material and spreading in the fill area, and trimming and compacting of the embankments. When compared with the original feasibility study, costs of most of the operations were fairly similar to those originally estimated. Had conventional methods been used, an estimated cost of carrying out the earthworks would have been 78 pence per cubic meter. The full-scale trial has shown the ability of the conveyor to reduce the costs of earth moving over the longer haul distances, its ability to work throughout the year, and to minimize losses of production caused by wet weather, the ease with which it can cross obstructions such as footpaths, roads and railways without interruption to normal traffic and deposition of mud, and its ability to minimize disturbance from noise and dust along the haul route. The environmental advantages will clearly make the use of belt conveyors attractive on many road schemes. For instance, it was found possible to operate the belt conveyor for 22 hours per day for five months of the contract without protest from residents of the housing estate through which the chalk was transported. Analyses of site data by computer using the cost models verified by the full-scale trial indicate that cost savings in earthwork construction might be achieved on selected major road schemes by the application of belt conveyors. Additionally, there are those sites where the problems of noise, dust and disruption of traffic associated with conventional methods of earth moving can be overcome by the use of belt conveyors.
With the elimination of noise and dust, the ease of crossing obstacles, the ability to minimize stoppages due to wet weather, and the reduction of costs over long haul distances, the demand for conveyors is likely to increase in the future, and increasing consideration will have to be given to the use of this type of equipment. Thank mm -hmm. you.